So you mentioned you destroyed your career. Tell me, you've teased me long enough. Why? What happened? All right, I'll tell you what happened. Uh, there was a gathering at the Gideon Putnam Hotel of every major executive at Clear Channel Radio. The people that I worked for asked Tobin and I to do the entertainment. So Tobin did some stand-up, which was fine. And I put together a, a slide presentation, which I was going to narrate. So the first slide was a picture of a mule. My, my regional VP was Manuel Rodriguez. And I started off by showing the mule and saying this was his first family car. Oh. Oh, no. <laughs> then I showed his boss on the golf course with his dick tied in a knot. Oh, no. And I realized five minutes into this that here I was making fun of the executives at Clear Channel while they were sitting at tables with other people that also worked at Clear Channel. And they were not gonna laugh at anything that involved laughing at their boss. Gene Romano, I don't know if Gene's still with uh, iHeart. Uh, he was the national uh, programming director. They, he, he basically stopped me, begged me to stop. And uh, I, I realized I'd made a really big mistake. And he pulled me out and he was like, you know, he said, dude, this is just awful, man. You can't go on with this, blah, blah, blah. I, I left there. I thought it was, I thought it was dead, done, job's over. Uh, but I had high ratings, so they left me alone. But, but I think that sort of canceled any opportunity for me to get syndicated in other markets. <laughs> It's a lesson learned here for the young people. Maybe ratings can do so much, but maybe don't use that as a presentation in front of your bosses. Don't, <laughs> don't show, show your senior VP with his dick out, tied in a knot on a golf course. No, it's not a good <laughs> But even though you did that, hang on. Didn't you end up in Cleveland? What happened with Cleveland? I thought you ended up getting actually boosted up in a bigger market. Well, what, what ended up happening is, uh, this is when I was at PIX, and... Um, was I at PIX? Yeah, I was at PIX. First off, when I was at PDH, they wouldn't let me out of my contract. Finally, finally, I got Mike Harris to let me out. But I was at uh, I was at PIX, and the show was doing really, really well with Maroney and I on it. And we they knew that we were getting offers. Maroney, I, Maroney and I flew out to uh, San Francisco, and we were interviewing at the number one rock station in San Francisco which was a big leap in markets, market size. So <laughs> we go through the interview and, you know, Mulroney is there and, uh, you know, he's making comments like we already have the job. And I get back uh, to Albany after the interview and I thought everything went well. But apparently, right after the interview, I used the word chink on the air. San Francisco is loaded with Chinese people. The radio station heard me say the word chink. And that was the end of that. <laughs> uh, they were no longer interested in uh, Mulroney and I. We, we did end up going to Cleveland. Uh, the show was really popular. We were number one in the market uh, in Albany. And uh, they, they had known that I had been looking at other, other market opportunities. So they brought John and I out to do the show from Cleveland. Um, part of the problem with, with that was, you know, I was separated from my wife at the time and I had, a, I had a daughter who was young. So, you know, at least a week a month, they had agreed to let me do the show from Albany, in Albany and Cleveland both, which was fine. Is the show airing in both Cleveland and Albany just for a reference point? Yeah, both yeah. Cleveland. Right. So I get out to Cleveland and I get out there and I, I, I realized that, you know, I was trying to put my marriage back together. Going to Cleveland was not a good idea. I had a bit of an emotional breakdown. You know, I really kind of had kind of fell apart there. 
Uh, the show was going well, but I really wanted to go back to Albany. Also, John uh, Mulrooney at the time wasn't going to honor the going back there for a week. He didn't want to do it. So I basically blew the show up. Uh, I, I came, that's my, that's my German shepherd, by the way. <laughs> Breaking up the tension though. I do appreciate it. It was good. <laughs> yeah. she's, she's a dolly. Um, so I came back at Christmas break after being in Cleveland for three months. And I basically told, uh, told them that I wasn't going to return. You know, I look back on it and that was a, that was a mistake. Obviously. I feel like. Yeah, I feel like pissed off isn't even the term to describe how Mulroney must have felt towards you at that point. Oh yeah, you hated my guts. Yeah, I mean we're we're on we're on good terms now, but yeah, no, I I, I blew, blew the show up, and it was Ellen out there as well, and uh, you know it was just uh, you know I had a real it was a real guys it was really an emotional breakdown, and it's, it's not something I look back on it now, and it wasn't wasn't what I would do now, but then yeah, uh, it was. Um, but the show doesn't end and your radio career doesn't end. No. You, you do bounce back from this. Yes. I come back to Albany and everything went, uh, you know, really well for the number of years. My salary doubled. I was making a lot of money. Uh, and I was relatively happy, uh, working back in Albany. Although, you know, I look, you can look back and see the mistake. You know, I see some of the stupid mistakes that I made, which probably prevented me from, be from getting a show that was nationally syndicated. Uh, you know, the stuff with the, with the bosses at the Gideon Putnam and a few other things like that, that was really not, not too bright on my part. Um, but I have to look back on my career and I'd be very grateful for it, for the fact that I had a chance to do what I really love to do, uh, and got paid for it for a long time. Um, but so I came back to Albany by myself and, uh, did the show. John and Ellen tried to do the show themselves in Cleveland. That really didn't work. Uh, and eventually it just, uh, I just continued to do the show at picks and put together, uh, I think at that time, I think Tobin had joined me shortly after that. And we just went on and we had a number of years that were really good. At one point, does Maul Rooney come back with you to Albany? No. Okay. He, 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 he really wasn't talking to me at that time. And he had his own set of issues, which I won't get into, but, uh, no, we were really estranged from each other. And, uh, you know, at that point, it was that that show was over. And I got to say, you know, I look back on it now and, you know, none of us were problem free. But Mulrooney was no question in my mind. One of him and Tobin were really just some of the best people that I could have ever worked with. Where, you know, I played I played the straight guy. And Mulrooney and Tobin both were hilariously funny. So, it, yeah. Now, now, even though you know you're working with Tobin now in Albany, and you just mentioned you're having success, things are going well in Albany. How long did you think this was going to like last for the rest of your career? For a 20 years, 30 years? Because radio, and I asked that some people would be like, "Well, guys, of course he thinks it's good." Radio is this interesting field where even though you're having success and financially things are working out well, the expectations from your bosses may be they want you to put up your stern numbers again or something like that. Well, I'll, I'll tell you kind of what happened. So, um. John and I are doing the show and we're having a lot of success at it. We're number one in Albany uh, during, during a few of the books. And then John, and I've said this to him, made the mistake and became difficult. This is John Tobin we're talking John about. John Tobin, not John Mulroney. And Tobin was negotiating with uh, the GM in Albany. And the talks fell apart and Tobin walked. And I thought at that time it was a very bad decision for him to do that. But, you know, he wanted a certain amount of money and they weren't willing to pay him. And, you know, like any negotiation, I, I don't think I don't think that it was handled all that well. And then from that point on, you know, I, I worked with a guy named Bob Levy, who was also a comic, who was also very good. Um, but the station at that time and a lot of radio was doing this. And, you, you know, this, I think, from personal experience, they were cutting and cutting and cutting. And my show used to be five people. And uh, at the time that uh, Tobin walked out, it was basically three people. And that's pretty much how it remained 
until they actually made another cut and it was me and Ellen basically doing the show with Lovey also. But I don't even know if they were paying Lovey at the time. So I got very bitter and I got angry. And, you know, I look back on it and I, I just sort of was like, fuck this. You know, I'm not going to I'm not going to do this. Uh, they basically dismantled what I did. And uh, I let anger get get to me. And uh, I basically ended my career. They signed me to a uh, it was a it was a five year contract uh, renewable uh, after two years. And after two years, they brought in there was a new guy that came in uh, from Zell, I think was his name, uh, who is a regional program guy didn't like me. I remember I had a meeting, meeting with him. He had a meeting with all the shows on, on picks and the meeting with him and my show was really short. And I was, I walked out of there and I was like, this is not good. And a month later they bought my contract out. So they had to pay me for seven months to stay home. And that's really how that whole thing at picks ended. And they brought so, in a, a couple of other guys who were still on. I don't really know much about them. I, I think the last time I, t I, I stopped listening to the radio show, I was angry about it for a long time. That is about February 2012 when that happened. So you guys go about from 1996, waking up with the wolf, 1996 to 2012. 16 years is still a remarkable and an incredible run that that show had. And you want to talk about you know, just upstate New York in general, not just the capital region. It is far and hard to find a show that goes 16 years in the mornings that beats Howard Stern. Like that's a remarkable run that you guys still had over that course. Well, I'm very grateful that we had the chance to do that. You know, as, as I'm sure you can imagine, looking back, there are some things that would do differently. <laughs> <laughs> you were risky though. Like some of your risks paid off and some of oh, them didn't. I got suspended five times, five times. <laughs> I remember one time, Tobin and I climbed up on a billboard. We were broadcasting from a billboard, not our billboard. It was just a billboard. I don't think it was our billboard. Anyway, it was along 90. Now, I'm afraid of heights. So I climb up, and this is treacherous, man. I climb up, and we're up there, and we're broadcasting. And I always really believed that I had a responsibility for the show to give back to the community it served. So we started to... Uh, we were raising some money for, I think, a home for uh, homeless vets. And, and and one of the things that we did is if you gave us $500 for the homeless veterans, uh, I'll do a minute live commercial for your business. That did not go over too well with my boss. <laughs> no, who was waiting for us when we got back to the radio station. So, yeah, I, I in my time, I certainly pissed my you know, a fair share of the people. Well, and also I was very difficult guy. Well, you worked with me for a little while, but I was passive at basically at that time. We should talk about that. Yes, <laughs> we will. I, I actually am going to set up like after five suspensions, you did get one job in between your stint at one Oh four five, the team and picks, but it didn't last too long. It lasted like nine days. Is, is that my calculator? Correct there. Something well, like that. I, I got a call from WDST, which is a, very progressive radio station in Woodstock. One I liked. I listened to DST. I liked the music, liked the personalities on it. The uh, uh, Gary Chekhov, who owns the station, which is very rare today, uh, wanted to see if he could attract part of the PIX audience. I mean, I went part of the PDH audience because I'd been on both stations. So I get there and the program director is, is, is kind of on the air with me, helping me, you know, learn the board, which I was never good at. <laughs> it was terrible. But I ran my own board. I always wanted to run my own board. I never wanted anybody else to run it. You know, it was just a matter of being able to drop things in and do things that I, I couldn't do if I wasn't in control of that part of it. And uh, it, was, it was awful. I, I mean, there are people there that actually, the DST fans, that didn't listen to me on DST, but hated me from PDH and, uh, and PICS. They just hated my reputation. I was politically incorrect. I was exactly the opposite of what, you know, somebody, some uh, Birkenstock wearing, bean eating hippie from Woodstock is going to like. <laughs> so they flooded the station with complaints. And after nine days, I said, I said to Gary, and he was really good about it. I said, this is just not a good fit for me. 
and I, I hated the whole time I was there. So you're out. How did you end up at 104.5? Theme? I feel like I know some of the reasons, but you might share some stuff with here with me that I don't even know about. Take us through how you ended up landing on an ESPN radio affiliate, which, look, you've listened to about an hour of this so far. We have not mentioned the word sports once until this moment, and you served as an afternoon drive host on an ESPN radio station. What a joke. <laughs> And I said to them, I said to um, the GM and the program director, I said, look, I, I, I'm a Yankee fan. Uh, I'm a Giant fan. Do I know the X's and O's? Do I know any of that stuff? No, I'm not a sports talk guy. And they were like, well, you know, we want the show to be 70% sports talk and 30% what you do. So, and, and poor Jeff LeVac. Uh, I, you know, I felt so bad for Jeff. You know, he was he was exactly the opposite of, of the kind of a radio personality I was. Jeff would, he planned every break. He mapped out the entire show and, you know, knew what he was going to do from break. To, well, you know, from break to break, he knew where he was going. And I was doing nothing but throwing the throwing him off. I was going to the left. He was going to the right. And I started with my stuff and. It just didn't fit in. It felt to me like it just didn't fit in with what Jeff does. And what Jeff did was, you know, it was very good for what he was doing, but it wasn't a good fit for me. And I remember I knew it wasn't going well and I, I wasn't getting to be myself. And, you know, I tried to get into, you know, a little deeper understanding of sports, uh, but that didn't really fly. So I got called into the office one day. And the, God, what was the guy's name? It was the uh, Steve Richards or Jake? It was both Jake and yeah. Steve Richards. Who I like, I like them both. I really I nothing, nothing against those guys at all. And they called me in, and they were like, "You know why you're here, right?" I was like, "Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah." I kind of know you can pick up your last check on Thursday or whatever it was. So that was the that was the end of that, and I was really having a miserable time. But I thought that. You know, I, w I didn't have, there was nothing else going on radio wise. Uh, and I tried to step out of what my comfort zone was and I wasn't, I was not into doing it. Yeah. Just a couple of things to talk about that history of that show real quick. So that lasted from April of 2016 to about September, like Labor Day weekend of exactly. September, 2016. So yeah. um, you mentioned like the thing with you and Levac. Look, for those who don't know Levac, Levac's got a great personality. He's like you, super entertaining, great storyteller, amazing on the air. But two things of radio, kind of you know, behind the scenes stuff of radio, you were doing what was called like the one mic, kind of controlling the show, navigating, right? When you were waking up with the wolf, you were the guy yeah. navigating the breaks yeah. and everything else. Yeah. Was that the first time in your career you didn't have the opportunity to work what's called the power chair, the one mic? So you've done this for 20 plus years. You're now in the number two chair, which is a difficult transition. It was completely and yeah, awkward. Right. And from the music and talk standpoint, the sports stuff, there's almost double the amount of time you have to fill break to break in comparison to what you were doing. So those are huge. I know it doesn't sound like a lot what I'm saying, but those are huge transitions for you to make, too. Although uh, there was a tier period of time, maybe six or seven years, where my show on picks had no music. Really? OK. Oh, yeah. We were four. We, we did five hours of talk. But I had five people on my show, you know, and I was the straight guy. So it, it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't the music part of it is the Jeff and I. I mean, I could tell I would say something and Jeff would just make a face. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, all right, I'm throwing this guy off. And I and, and it was not a good fit. Look, we tried. I mean, the basically the conversation at the end of it was, look, we tried it. It didn't work. And I, I agreed. Uh, a few things that I remember too. Remember, I have the sports background. Yeah. I'm looking to get like these reporters and these talk show hosts on. I remember one day you pulled me in the hallway and you're like, "Hey, I need you to call Gilbert Gottfried for me." Yes. And I'm like, "Wait, the guy from Aladdin?" He's like, "Yeah, you're like, yeah, yeah. I gotta have you call the guy from Aladdin." I go, "What's he coming on the show?" He's like, "Yeah, I just coming on the show." I'm like, "Okay, I guess I'm calling the guy from Aladdin to come on the show." And then another time at five fifteen, it was like right around the NFL draft. So yeah. You know, the diehard football fans want their picks. They want to know who yep. their team is taking and everything else. And you said, hey, guys, at 5.15, and we're talking to Jackie the Joke Man Marley. I'm like, the, from Stern? Jackie the Joke Man? Yeah. You're like, yeah. Like, today we're going to talk about him. I'm like, 
I, I love radio and I love Jackie. I don't know if today's the day we want to do it, like a week before the draft, yeah. <laughs> stuff like that. Yeah. And I was like, draft schmaft. <laughs> Get Jackie the joke man on. Yeah. And, 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 you know, Jeff is a great sports talk show host, but it just didn't, as you know, you were there. Uh, I, I threw him off way too much. Uh, and it was just, you know, I think that, when you find people that you can work with and it works, it's great. But it's not as easy as it looks. You've got to really have the right two personalities. And he and I just weren't right. He was doing what he what he needed to do. And you were doing what you needed to do for that station, uh, sports-wise. And I was just a bad link in the fence. There was only one true time where I actually thought, you know what, they're going to fire me. Like, they're going to take me out over you or LeVac. I don't know if you even remember doing this, but I was convinced, like, all right, today's the day I'm going to get canned. So they wanted you two to cut a promo. I've never told this story before. They okay. wanted you guys to cut a promo, like a 30-second promo, promoting stuff at Saratoga. They want you to go out there and do that. So they're you're like, you guys didn't want to read the script. You're like, let's just go off and like give them like a, a, a thing of the show. So you decided what a good idea would be is you decided to insult the, the now late Mary Lou Whitney yes. and said something about a child, a husband, or something along the effects of that. Like, don't forget yeah. to watch the Whitney and his her child husband, something like that. So they, you're like, no, no, you and Levesque both told me, they're like, no, just send it. It'll be funny. They're looking for outrageous. They're looking, you know, the stuff we've talked about through all this thing. I remember this. So I'm like, okay, I guess I'll send our sponsor this. And I'm telling you, the email we got back, I was just like, they just roasted all of us. And I got pulled down to the office with you. And somehow I got blamed where it's like, why are you as the producer sending this? I'm like, what am I supposed to do? They told me to send it. I'm like, I'm getting taken out right now. Like, this is the day. That sponsor is so much bigger than I am right now. They're just going to say someone needs to get fired. Uh, I think my office is already back. I don't know how many people even know the story. But like, you guys insulted Mary Lou Whitney, sent it to the sponsor, said, hey, can we run this on the air? I was like, okay, that that's the end for guys. <laughs> Yeah, the kind of backstory to that 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 you guys didn't know is that every opening day of the track, I broadcast my show on picks from there. And we had Mary Lou on every year. And her husband, John, I believe is his name, who was quite a bit younger than she was. And one of the years, Mulrooney just went off on Mary Lou Whitney and her child husband. And they were laughing their asses off, both of them. So we thought it was 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 fine, uh, but apparently not. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's that's kind of see the, my background with dealing with Mary Lou and and her husband was very friendly. I was surprised that you know there was such a such a, a massive uh, uh, amount of negativity that came from the track because I'd had her on for like seven or eight years previously, and we always joked around. So, well, there's, yeah, that's what I mean. I, I don't know if you felt the same way about radio. Maybe it's how I was brought up through this industry, but like when someone's let go from your job or from your station, you're supposed to act like it never happened. Like it was just like a dream and no, no, no. They were never on the air. It actually was somebody else. So I got so trained so young that like, Hey, if someone ever gets let go from the station, make sure you don't talk to them or contact them or talk yeah. to them on social, which I don't know why that is the way it is in the business. So if people wonder like, why you know i didn't reach I, I was told that i don't know if if you had that same experience where like if someone was let go you're supposed to act like it never happened yeah they don't ever want you to mention them again they don't want you to act like they didn't exist because they don't want they don't want to take a step back in the past you know and uh it's I, i'll tell you one thing that kind of that surprised me a little bit it's sort of related to this i put out a dv i put out 19 cds comedy cds and one of them was a DVD CD. And after I got canned from PIX, they had a whole bunch of them in a box at the radio station. And Lovey was still working there. So I said, Lovey, let me let me have the you know, let me have the box of C C of DVDs. I mean, I'll pay for, pay for them if they want. And they would not let me have them. They wouldn't let me have them. Wow. It was it was amazing. I was like, "What are you going to do with them? They're sitting in your closet. You're not going to acknowledge they exist anymore. You know, I want to give it to my friends, but no, they wouldn't do it. So yeah, it really in radio when you're gone, it is like you are dead. 
But you are not dead, Wolf. By any stretch of the imagination, you're not dead. I can ask this question, though. Would you consider yourself retired? Like, is Wolf is Wolf done with radio? If someone calls you today and said, we got a job for you, are you going to say yes to that? It depends on what the job is. If I'll tell you what I did learn. Uh, I learned that I love radio, but I have to do what I do. And if I can't do that, I'm not going to take the job. You know, it's a lesson learned from ESPN. It just wasn't me. Uh, it's a lesson learned from a few other stations that I worked at where they, they didn't want to let me be myself. I mean, my rise over it uh, to do morning radio started at PDH, and I had different slots than the morning, and I was able to develop who I, who I was. But I, I had such a horrible time uh, at DH, at uh, DST, and at ESPN because I just wasn't myself. So, no, I would never do that again. Well, here's the question, and I know you know this because your calendar probably says it somewhere. It is 2021, and I say that in the sense of the world has changed so much from when your show was popular in the late 90s and early 2000s. Do you think even the guy like Stern, like Stern is a completely different host than what he was 20 years ago. Oh, yeah. Do you think your show would work in 2021 or your style can still work? I think that if I think funny is funny. And I think that if you're funny, people are going to are, are going to like it. Although I will tell you that I, I would never I would never take another job again where I had restrict, which is probably why you'll, you'll never see me on the radio again, where there are so many restrictions uh of what they expect and and you know there was a time like i worked for this guy bob osfeld who grew up in radio he was just an incredible boss there's a time and and i watched this happen with uh with uh, Kristen and john cooper two people i have a lot of respect for they had to bend what they knew about radio to fit in with the corporate radio gods wanted and it was not what uh, i liked about radio at all and it's changed completely. I remember I tuned in, I guess, picks for a few minutes a few years back. And there was there was a, there was a woman on, I forgot what time of day it was, talking about recipes. And I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> Classic rock station? What the what is this? So yeah, I think that big corporate radio has unfortunately had the really wrong attitude about how to do it. And they've, they have a lot of competition now. I mean, for music, I don't know anybody that listens to radio for music anymore. They go to Spotify or Pandora or Amazon. I'm, I have, I have a subscription to Amazon music. I never tune the radio in for music anymore. Yeah. It's a different world. It's, it's a, you know, podcast where people are listening to this now, YouTube, everything else, you know, and, and probably for both of us. And again, You've gone through this industry far longer than I have. That's the frustrating part about it. It's like, you know what good content can be. You know what stuff good on the air. But when you get this pushback of, well, we want this to be on the air because they're spending a lot of money. Or we want this on the air because we think we owe this to them. Well, that might not be what the listener wants anymore. And you got to see it firsthand what your listeners responded to the most. Yeah. Yep. Um, it was, uh, you know, I love radio. I always will. Uh, but I'm not going to compromise myself to be, you know, I, if somebody offered me a job today and there were restrictions with it, I wouldn't take it. How about this? Maybe a podcast format, a YouTube yeah. channel. Could we ever see the crew get back together, though? Like, I don't know if we get back on getting there with Gaz or Godzilla Media or anything else, but like if you, Maul, Rooney, and Tobin reunited, is the possibility there for you three to get back together and Ellen? Well, not in the same room because of where we live. It would make it really difficult, but using software like you're using right now, it, it it certainly might be possible. I haven't talked to Ellen in a long time. I mean, I'll always love Ellen. She's she's in Saratoga, and I think she's doing stuff for TMZ. And John Mulrooney, I talked to him about a month ago. He's basically retired. Uh, I mean, the pandemic, no, there was no there was no stand up comedy shows. There were no cruise ships, which is where he made his money. So John retired. He still does, and you can check him out on Facebook, John Mulrooney. He does these uh, uh, videos uh, every day or so where he just sort of uh, um, free associates and just speaks whatever's on his on his mind. So I, I would I would never I would never do it again where the show is restricted. The only time I would ever do it is if I was allowed to do what I know I know how to do, and not try to bend who I am into something that doesn't fit me. 
I'll let you go on this. Can you give me one more Bob Belber story? You and I have talked a lot uh, before we recorded about Bob Belber. For those who don't know, he runs the Times Union Center here locally. Just give me one of your favorite pranks you used to pull on Bob Belber. Bob Belber is a great guy. And I used to call up Bob uh, often to get tickets to give away on the air, which he would do. So one of the things that I always felt it was my job is to get attention for the radio station. So I find out that the Dixie Chicks were going to play the Times Union Center. The, the, the show was not announced or released. And I went on the air and I talked about the Dixie Chicks doing the Times Union Center. <laughs> I get called into Dennis Lammy, the GM's office, and they are screaming at me because the Times Union Center is, not only is the Times Union Center upset, but the Dixie Chicks pulled the date because oh. they heard I was in, uh, that I was talking about them on the air. Eventually, they re they re they rescheduled the date. But I got called in and I was being yelled at, and I said, "You know what? I get paid to try and take ratings away from the country station, which is a top ranked station in the market. So if I can do that by announcing a Dixie Chicks show before them." that I'm doing my job and they backed off. They did. But yeah, I, I was, they weren't going to fire me, but they were, they were really upset. I mean, I actually could have, I could have caused the Dixie chicks to not come to all me. <laughs> <laughs> You've had an amazing life, an amazing career. I hope you found this therapeutic. I hope you enjoyed all this. I think we've covered about everything. I probably could have done another four hours with you. We've shared a lot of stories. I'm happy to say we've reunited. This is the first time you and I have talked in like four or five years. Yeah, I apologize time. for following the radio etiquette. I hate that. Like the moment I was no longer radio, I'm like, why didn't I just talk to people when they got let go? Like as if like the bosses were going to come down and say, I've got your phone tapped, by the way, guys. I know you reached out to Wolf. Like, I don't know why I always had that fear of everybody, but I'm glad we got to do this uh, as a radio guy and as a media guy. Getting to nerd out about some of these stories and hear about your career. I had a lot of fun doing this. Yeah, me too. It's really fun to take a look back on it and be able to talk about it openly. And I don't have any. The radio was very, very good to me, and I have no regrets. Wolf, thank you so much. Um, I know you're on Facebook. I want to. You're not a big social media guy, but if people no. want to contact you, Facebook's the best way. Yeah, they can do it on Facebook. Uh, just look, look uh, for Bob Wolf. I mean, I, I think I have like three Facebook pages, none of which I ever do anything with. But look for the one that says Bob Wolf. I think I still get those messages. So Awesome, man. Wolf, I appreciate the time, man. And who knows what the future is going to hold for you. I wish you the best of luck. And who knows, maybe again in the future, if the gang gets reunited, you guys can hop on here one day, months down the line, or maybe a year plus down the line. Well, guys, I've always loved, uh, loved what you do. And uh, now I will be a regular listener. Appreciate it, man. Yeah. Take care. You take